This is going to be verse by verse of Romans chapter 5. And we're going to see some things that happen at salvation. And we're going to look at the words that end in I-O-N. These great Bible words, King James Bible words, that describe salvation to the Bible reader. If you read the King James Bible, then you are going to see these words over and over and over again. And these are some things that you need to study over and over again and that you need to teach over and over again. Just basic things that you should keep on repeat in your mind. And number one is the word justification. This is something that happens to you at salvation. You get justified. Romans 5, 1 says, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And justification is a legal declaration that you are righteous. A legal declaration by God. God justifies you the moment you believe the gospel. He makes it just as if you never sinned. Justified, never sinned. You're justified by faith. Titus 3, 7 says that being justified by His grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. It's by His grace, by grace through faith. Galatians 3, 11 says but that no man is justified by the law. In the sight of God, it is evident, for the just shall live by faith, so no man is justified by the law. 1 Corinthians 6.11 And such were some of you, but ye are washed, but ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Galatians 2.16 Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, there you see it again, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. Romans 5, 9, Much more than being now justified by His blood, we shall be saved from wrath through Him. So it's by His blood that we're justified. Galatians three twenty four. Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us into Christ that we might be justified by faith. So over and over again, you see, we're justified by grace through faith in the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ and not by the works of the law. And that's made very clear. It is the shed blood of Jesus Christ which justifies, not your works, not your water baptism. And there are many self-righteous people who think they are justified by their own goodness, but if they aren't declared righteous by God, then they aren't righteous. So learn these doctrines of salvation like justification. It means that God declares you righteous. And it's fun to go over the strange doctrines in the Bible, but it's more needful and more beneficial for you to go over the basics over and over and over. And number two, we're going to see peace with God, propitiation. We're going to look at the propitiation. Romans 5, 1, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And propitiation, what that means, it's the, the act of appeasing wrath. And Jesus Christ died on the cross and took our sins, became sin for us, even though He knew no sin, He was innocent. When we believe on Him, it gives us peace with God. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And the peace with God shows that the wrath has been appeased. Jesus Christ took our sin. He took our hell. He took the wrath for us. He paid our payment. We just have to accept the payment. Imagine that somebody said they have a check for all the rest of your life, your life's expenses that you're going to have, all the cars you're going to have to buy and all the clothes and all the houses you'll have to buy in your lifetime, pretend that somebody said they already had it paid for, you just have to accept the payment or reject the payment. And that's what Jesus did when he died on the cross for you. He paid for your eternity in heaven, and now it's up to you to accept the payment. If you reject the payment, then you die and go to hell. But he is our propitiation. He appeases the wrath of God and gives us peace with God. First John 2, 2, and he is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Not just a select few, but anybody 
who wants to accept the payment can come and accept the payment. First John 4.10, Herein is love, not that we loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. A great Bible word, propitiation. Colossians 1.20, And having made peace through the blood of His cross, by Him to reconcile all things unto Himself, by Him I say whether there be things in earth or things in heaven. So the blood of Jesus Christ makes peace between you and God. It appeases the wrath of God. The blood of Jesus Christ gives you peace with God. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, as verse 1 of Romans 5 says. And there is a difference between the peace of God and peace with God. If you have peace with God, then you have believed in the Lord Jesus Christ to be saved. And after you get saved, you can have the peace of God, which comes when you serve Him and do what He wants you to do. Romans 5, 9. Go down, skip down some verses in the chapter we're studying in Romans chapter 5 and look at verse 9. It says, Much more then, being now justified by His blood, we shall be saved from wrath through Him. So we've already talked about how we're justified by His blood. But notice it says we shall be saved from wrath through Him. Propitiation is appeasing of wrath. Jesus Christ was our substitute. He took our place and He took the wrath of God on Him so that we don't have to suffer His wrath. We're saved by wrath through Him. He is our propitiation. Jesus appeased the wrath of God so I don't have to go through the tribulation. I don't have to go to hell. I don't have to be on the receiving end of the sharp two-edged sword when Jesus Christ comes back at the second coming. Now number three, Okay, we've already seen justification, we've seen propitiation, and now I want to look at how we get access to grace. Romans 5, 2, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So, if any man is saved, he is saved by grace through faith. Just basic. And something you need to hear over and over again. And if you die in unbelief, then you have rejected the grace of God. Grace is God giving you something you don't deserve. And what you don't deserve is salvation. Mercy is God keeping you from something you do deserve. And what you do deserve is to be rotting in hell for eternity. But if you accept the payment for sin, which is the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, then you get in on the grace of God. You get in on that grace. He will give you the free gift, which is something you don't deserve. Romans 5.2 says, By whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand. Notice that word stand. If you're saved, then you're in good standing with God. Study out this subject of your standing versus your state. And I have a study on this already. If you just want to look here on this channel and, and search for that study. But if you're saved, then your standing in Christ is righteous. No matter what happens, no matter what you do, no matter how many times you sinned after you were saved, the Lord will see you as righteous as the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's heresy to... A lot of people who believe in eternal insecurity instead of believing eternal security. But it's a Bible fact. And that's your standing or position in the Lord Jesus Christ. But your state is different. Your state is however you're living in the flesh at any given moment. If you're sinning, then that means your state is, it, is not matching your standing, which is perfect. You need to try your best to get your state to match your standing as much as you possibly can. And you're not going to be able to completely overcome the flesh until you get a new body at the rapture. And that's your glorification. Now, number four, we see tribulation, patience, experience, hope. Something that happens at salvation is these four words. In your life, these, thing, these four things are going to come. They're going to happen. Now, a lost person will experience tribulation. 
but that tribulation doesn't come for suffering for righteousness sake and suffering persecution from the Lord a lost person doesn't suffer persecution from standing up from the Lord I mean and it doesn't have to do with the devil beating him down because He's out soul winning and stealing the devil's children because he's not out soul winning. If anything, he's hindering the work of the Lord. So he, he'll, he'll face tribulation because the way of a transgressor is hard, but it's a different kind of tribulation. Now, Romans 5.2, let's look at Romans 5.2 through 4. It says, By whom also we have access by faith unto this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience, and patience experience, and experience hope. So if you're saved, then you're going to face tribulation. And Christians are going through tribulation now. They went through tribulation in the past. This, however, doesn't mean they're going through the tribulation that the book of Revelation talks about, because really, that isn't the title of that time period, even though we call it that, it's really just a description. There shall be great tribulation. But the real name for that time period isn't really the tribulation. That's just a description of it. But Paul was going through tribulation. Second Corinthians 7, 4 says, Great is my boldness of speech towards you. Great is my glorying of you. I am filled with comfort. I am exceeding joyful in all our tribulation." So Paul experienced tribulation. Tribulation that he faced for standing up for the Lord, for not being ashamed of the gospel of Christ. And that's something that's going to happen at salvation. If you do right and live for God, is you're going to experience tribulation. First Thessalonians 3, 4, For verily when we were with you, we told you before that we should suffer tribulation, even as it came to pass, and you know. So since Paul went through tribulation, he got patience. The more trouble you go through, the more patience you'll get. And there are spurts in my life when every day it seemed like something bad would happen. And I got to the point to where it really didn't even bother me anymore. And I got patient with the bad things that were happening over and over again in my life. And I just handled them better the more bad stuff that happened. And all of this tribulation gave me experience. All the tribulation and experience that you get is priceless. You shouldn't want to get rid of all the bad things and experiences that you've had to face because it makes you better. You go through the fire and you come out better. If you went through pain, then you can help other people in pain. So glory in tribulations like Paul does. Romans 5, 3, and not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience. Tribulation will get you patience. And patience, experience and experience hope. The tribulations and experiences of this life make the hope of Jesus Christ and the rapture and the next life even greater. It just makes you want to be with Jesus Christ more. makes you want to go to heaven more. That Romans 5.5 5, And hope maketh not ashamed because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given unto us. So the Christian's hope will not make him ashamed because his hope is in eternal things. Now this hope isn't like saying I hope so. It's more like I know so. I know Jesus Christ is in me. I know he's coming back to get me. He is my hope. And I don't really have to worry about the tribulations down here because of my hope. And somebody said there is no hope in the Pope, but there's hope in the Lord Jesus Christ. Titus 2.13 says, Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. So He is our hope. And He, you're not ashamed if that's your hope. Number five, something that happens at salvation, you get the Holy Ghost. Romans 5.5, 5, And hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed, in our, shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. Notice that phrase, by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. When you get saved, the Holy Ghost is given unto you. It's given as a gift. You didn't earn it. You didn't earn it because you spoke in tongues or because you, because of your daily sanctification. 
you got it because it was a gift. And Paul teaches that if you don't have it, then you're not saved. Romans 8 and 9 says, But ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he's none of his. So that's saying, if you don't have the Spirit, then you're none of his. You're not even saved. And a friend of mine who was like a charismatic or something like that, he told me that I don't have the Holy Ghost since I don't speak in tongues. And I said, okay, so you, you're saying I'm not saved. And he said, no, 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 you're, you're saved. You just don't have the Holy Ghost. And I said, oh, well, what about Romans 8 and 9 that says, now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. And he said, oh, I, I haven't gotten that far yet. And that's the problem. He only got as far as his preacher told him. But the Bible says, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. And you get the Holy Ghost the moment you believe the gospel. Ephesians 1.13 says, In whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. In whom also, after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. promise. So Romans 5.5 5 says, The love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost. Love is one of the fruits of the Spirit in Galatians 5. And a Christian who is right with God will operate on this word. God loves him. He loves God. The man loves his friends, his family, even his enemies. And if he has love in his heart, it will eventually show in his countenance. It will show in how he deals with other people and, it, and how he deals with the men who are mean to him. You can tell somebody's got the love of God in his heart when he deals kindly with people who are mean to him and put him down and give him a hard time every day of his life. Sorry about the noise. I do these studies at work on break in, in the parking lot, so that's why it's kind of noisy. Now, number six, something that happens at salvation. You get a perfect sacrifice. You receive a perfect sacrifice for sin. Romans 5, 6 says, When we... For when we were yet without strength, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. If you are born again, you have a perfect sacrifice, and that is Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is God in the flesh, and He died as a sacrifice for your sin. And He's perfect. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, For He hath made Him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. Jesus Christ, who is godly, died for the ungodly. Jesus Christ, who was rich, came down to us that are poor. He left heaven to come and live down here where there is filth and wickedness. And He did this because He loved us. He died for the ungodly. That's us. We're ungodly. You can't be saved unless you're ungodly because He died for the ungodly. And if you're not ungodly, then you don't need a sacrifice. You don't need a Savior if you're not ungodly. You can get to heaven by your own goodness. When a person gets saved, he must realize he is lost, and he must realize he can't save himself. And if he don't know these things, then he doesn't even understand why he needs to be saved. He doesn't understand the gospel, because the gospel says Christ died for our sins. If you don't even understand that you're a sinner, then I don't know what to tell you. Knowing that you're ungodly must be part of any gospel presentation. When Paul gave the gospel in 1 Corinthians 15, he said, Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. And you know what I'm, you know what it means? You have your sins and they need to be paid for. Christ died for our sins. That's why he had to die. And that tells me that I'm ungodly and you're ungodly. And we need a perfect sacrifice for this reason because the blood of bulls and goats can't take away sin. And all these guys accuse me of saying that men were eternally saved by works under the law in the Old Testament. But no man uh, that's a real Bible-believing dispensationalist teaches that keeping the law and the blood of bulls and goats gave, them men, gave the Old Testament saints eternal salvation. They teach it got them to paradise and kept them safe until... The perfect sacrifice came, the Lord Jesus Christ. And technically, you can't say they were saved, but they were safe. 
we've just got used to using that phrase saved because, you know, we're in the New Testament and that's a New Testament word. But those Old Testament saints couldn't have been saved. All they had was the blood of bulls and goats, and that can't take away sin. And none of the Old Testament saints ever got to heaven without the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. But the blood of Jesus Christ hadn't been shed yet when they were here. So they had to go to paradise in the heart of the earth when they died, where they would wait. Romans 5, 7 says, For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. So a person is more likely to die for a good man. But Jesus Christ died for every man. We're all bad, but some people are worse than others. And, and Jesus Christ died for the bad and those that are worse than bad. And it's up to us to accept the payment for sin. Romans 5, 8 says, But God commended His love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So God showed us love by dying for us. He showed His love in that even though we are sinful men, Jesus Christ took our place and died on the cross for us anyway. John fifteen thirteen says, Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. First John four nineteen, we love him because he first loved us. Now number seven. What happens at salvation? You get the blood applied to your soul. We've already talked about the blood quite a bit. Romans five nine, much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. So we're justified by his blood. And without the blood, no man has forgiveness of sins or gets into heaven. And anybody who says it was only his death that saves, he's a liar. Because Jesus Christ had to shed his blood when he died. And when you believe the gospel, the blood is applied to your soul. Just like at the Passover, they had to put the blood on the doorpost and on the lintel so the death angel would pass over them. Just like Rahab put, a, put out a scarlet thread in her window to keep from getting killed, the blood is important. And number eight, another word that ends in I-O-N, reconciliation. At salvation, you were reconciled. Romans 5.10 says, For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of His Son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by His life. So before you were saved, you were the enemy of God. You didn't have peace with God. You weren't in the Lord's army. You were a child of hell in the devil's army. But Jesus Christ died for us, making it possible to be on the winning side. On the same side as the Lord Jesus Christ, I'm saved by His life. I'll be saved as long as Jesus Christ has life. And Jesus Christ is eternal and He's never going to die, so I'll always have life and never die. Number nine, you receive the atonement. Romans 5.11, not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have now received the atonement. And that's, the atonement could also be looked, looked at as at one -ment. And you are a reconciled child of God. You're at one with God. You're in the same body as Him, and He's in you. You're in the body of Christ. You're at agreement and you're not at enmity with Him anymore, you're at one with the Lord Jesus Christ, at one -ment, atonement. Number 10, you're free from the curse. Romans 5.12 says, Therefore as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. And the one man who brought in sin was Adam. Eve ate the forbidden fruit. She gave it to him. He ate it. Sin passed on down into everybody's blood ever since. Death passes upon all men. You're spiritually dead before you're saved and your body will die. The, and the reason you have a sin nature is because of Adam and because he sinned. And people who don't believe in the gap will teach that Adam was the first person to sin so that they can teach that there was no pre-Adamic race between Genesis 1-1 and 1-2. Now, there was no pre-Adamic race of humans, but there was some people that was living on earth between Genesis 1, 1 and 1, 2, that was Lucifer and the spirits on, on the earth before man. And that's when Lucifer fell. And he sinned. He sinned before Adam. So this doesn't prove that... This doesn't prove against the gap. Not only this, but Eve even sinned before Adam. So it isn't that Adam is the first person to sin. It's that he's the one who passed the sin on to the world. It entered the world through him. But Eve sinned first. She changed the word of God and then ate the apple before Adam did. 
Now Romans 5.13 says, For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. So people were breaking the law before it even came out. And even then they had the law written in their hearts, like Abimelech in the Old Testament who knew it was wrong to commit adultery. But sin is not imputed when there is no law. And like I've said before, when a young child or the feeble mind doesn't understand that they have sinned against God, they're safe. And they wouldn't go to hell when they die because sin is not imputed to them if they don't even know they're a sinner when, and when there is no law, if they don't understand. Romans 5.14 says, Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over, over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who was the figure of him that was to come. So death reigned from Adam to Moses. And even before the law, men were dying. Even those who haven't sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression. So what's that mean? Meaning all these babies who died b before or even after they're born, right after they're born, they they're they're suffering the effects of sin. And innocent babies died in Noah's flood. Uh, they've never sinned, yet they suffered the consequences of sin. Romans five fourteen, nevertheless death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who is the figure of him that was to come. So Adam is the figure of him that was to come. The him is Jesus Christ. But Jesus Christ did the opposite for man that Adam did. Jesus Christ brings life. Adam brought death. This shows a figure or type doesn't have to be an exact match because there are similarities like when Adam was pierced in his side to get his bride. Jesus did the same thing. Uh, he was pierced in his side to get his bride when he died on the cross and the soldier took a spear and pierced his side. So, they're alike, but they're also different. Romans 5.15, But not as the offense, so also is the free gift. For if through the offense of one many be dead, much more the grace of God and the gift by grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ, hath abounded unto many. So by one offense of Adam, many people died. By the free gift of Jesus Christ, many will have eternal life. Romans 5.16 Romans 5.16 says, And not as it was by one that sinned, so was the gift. For the judgment was by one to condemnation, but the free gift is of many offenses unto justification. I notice the word free gift, as we've already talked about. If something is free, then you didn't buy it or work for it. Now all the fake TV preachers that say, We'll give you this free gift if you send in your donation. That's not free. Um, nothing you do earns you this gift. You can't send in a donation to get this gift. You believe on the Lord Jesus Christ to get the gift. The Lord gives it to you. And this means the only one with bragging rights is Him. Because He did all the work for you on the cross. You didn't do any of the work. Romans 5.17 says, For if by one man's offense death reign by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one Jesus Christ. The sad thing is most people will stay in Adam and choose death over the life that's in Jesus Christ. They let death reign over them. And the Bible says, She that liveth in pleasure is dead while she liveth. Uh, people aren't pro-choice, they're pro-death. They love death metal. They love to see death on TV. They'll choose Adam, who brought death and sin into the world, over Jesus Christ, who brings life into the world. Romans 5.18 says, Therefore, as by the offense of one, Talking about Adam, by the offense of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation. And that's the devil's favorite word that ends in I-O-N, is condemnation and damnation. Came upon all men to condemnation. Even so, by the righteousness of one, Jesus Christ, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. So yeah, the devil's favorite I-O-N is condemnation and damnation. But the Lord's is justification, propitiation, reconciliation, 
propitiation. And, but if you stay in the image of Adam without getting saved, you stay in the image of Adam, and if you stay that way, you receive condemnation. If you receive Jesus Christ, you get justification. Now, Romans 5.19, For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. So you're all sinners because Adam disobeyed God, but you can all be made righteous because Jesus Christ obeyed God. He was without sin and became sin for us, dying on the cross, taking our place, and if we trust in Him, then we can be made righteous. Romans 5.20, Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. And what that saying is, the grace of God is stronger than your sin. Where sin abounds, grace abounds more. Romans 5.21, That as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. So the moment you believe the gospel, you get eternal life, and the righteousness of Jesus Christ imputed to you. That's the imputation. Imputation is God taking the righteousness of Jesus Christ, putting it on you, and then not imputing your unrighteousness to you. Because when you get saved, God cuts your soul loose from your flesh. So every time you sin... Those sins aren't applied to your soul like they were before you got saved. See, before you got saved, your flesh was stuck to your soul. So every time you sinned, all those sins were applied to the soul. But now, the Lord did an operation, cut your soul loose from your flesh, and now those sins aren't applied to your soul anymore. And that's how your soul stays perfect and just as righteous as the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's the spiritual circumcision, another word that ends in I-O-N. So you study all these I-O-N words, words that end in I-O-N, and you're going to get assurance of salvation. You're going to see it's impossible for a born-again believer to lose his salvation because salvation has nothing to do with what you're doing before you're saved, and it has nothing to do with what you're doing after you get saved. It's all about what Jesus Christ did on the cross and you accepting what He did on the cross to be your payment for sin. But this has been Romans chapter 5 and we've looked at things that happen at salvation. So meditate on these things. Memorize these things. Study them frequently even though you already know them and teach them frequently even if the people that you're teaching already know it. This is, these are things that you need to go over, over and over again.